Well, as Subit mentioned, it would be uh, presented jointly by Dr. Bohenek and myself. So with that, the first part is uh, Dr. Bohenek, so I'll request her to get started. First of all, just as that is teeing up, I, I do want to thank um, Dr. Kapat for the collaboration and partnership and the discussions around what I think are a very important uh, topic. You know, if you think about energy today, uh, we're, we're at a very interesting time. We're in, we're in a time where our industry, the energy industry is in transition. And I always think about things when things are in transition, there's opportunity. There's opportunity for research. There's opportunities for technology development. There's op opportunities for economic development. So there's so much opportunity in what is happening in today's, uh, you know, in our country and globally. And part of that has to do with hybrid hydrogen and around decarbonization. So thank you, Jay, for inviting me to join you on the, what I think, again, is a really important topic. So if we go to the next slide, and some of these slides that I'm putting up are kind of to give us you know, I, I guess one thing I hope everybody walks away with is to be a little bit inspired and to understand through that inspiration, we can um, both, you know, within the University of Central Florida, uh, help and contribute to some of these rather challenging problems. So when you think about energy, I think one of the things that is fascinating to me is the, you know, the, the importance of food, water in, in, in our lives and energy. And when you think about population and population growth, um, you know, across our world, if you look at the bottom there, and this chart is a little bit dated, I think right now, the current population in 2021 is around 7.9 billion people on this earth. It's planned to be doubled by the time we get to 2100. And so, you know, that means we need unprecedented levels of affordable, accessible, abundant food, water, and energy. And because all of those things couple together really enable a quality of life. So this isn't just some, you know, we, this, is, this is big and it uh, has societal impact, especially as we look across, across the world. Uh, next slide, please. Another way to look at it and, you know, is when you think about these, this chart here, what it's really trying to show you is in orange, people who lack any adequate electricity, in red, people who have no electricity. And these could have varied, you'll see the source was from 2015, could easily be updated, but I doubt if it edged so dramatically different. And so the importance of this, again, is to say, much of the world still lives without adequate electricity and energy. And why is that important? Energy increases, there's, there's, it increases lifespan, access to healthcare, access to nutritious food, access to clean water, access to education. So quality of life, the life that we enjoy in the United States um, really requires us to really tackle energy. Uh, next slide. Now shifting to the to what I would call, you know, the, the big challenge. And the big challenge is giving, given the need and growing demand for energy, how do we do this in a way that we don't risk our, you know, our earth? You know, how do we make sure that we're achieving the, you know, the growing demand while reducing the risks to climate? There's a lot of information, and this will just be a quick snapshot of it, but I think it's important to just highlight a few things um, about decarbonization, what that means in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, but it really means let's get that CO2 out, out of our atmosphere. And when something is in the atmosphere, that means it's it's all of our responsibilities. It's a world responsibility. So the 2030 Paris uh, Climate Agreement really talks about how do we, all countries that, that sign up to that agreement, how do we start ensuring that we're limiting global warming? And you know they put a target to make sure it was well below two degrees. I think at some point people are talking about less than 1.5 degrees. 
in order to help stabilize and you know reduce the risks of what it what that climate can what that climate change and, and the warming of the earth can do to societies. I know a lot of people have different beliefs on you know um, the timing and you know of of how all that is, but within the within the agreement, it really looks at look, trying to achieve net zero by 2050. And so this is huge. It's a you know I, I I say you think about scaling and you think about how do you do all of this right? How do you accelerate development of technology and transfer at a pace that's going to make a difference? How are you going to think about it differently when energy, you know, there's no silver lining. There's no one bullet, right? It's, uh, you know, there's no single technology, no single energy type or source. It really has to be looked at all, all of this all together. So it's a burning challenge. And, you know, many, many are, are working on different elements of this. And one quote that I've seen in, in an article is, hey, Hey, this isn't this isn't about how long. It's it's about how fast we can do things. So again, I think of it from you know a standpoint of a university is you know research. How do you transfer that research as quickly as possible to make the kind of impacts and contributions we want to have? So if we go to the next slide, this gives you another perspective. Again, this comes from there's a lot of information out there, but one of the sources that um, I highly recommend is called IEA. It's, it, and IEA is the International Energy Agency. Lots of information about energy. And they, they publish every year what's called a World Energy Outlook. So this is just a snapshot of it. There's a lot of information in there. But what I wanted to convey here is just about consumption and sectors, because I think that's important. So when you look on the left-hand side of this chart, you can see here we are in 2020. And I don't know what the percentage uptick is, but you can just see from the chart that by 2050, the increased need for electrical power, where you see the industrial uses for energy increasing and transportation. So right now, when you think about, you know, if we, if, where do you make impacts? Uh, these are ways to think about where you make impacts. Energy and the electrical power generation is going to have a high need in the industry uh, usage of that energy and then in transportation. Uh, on the right hand side, it looks at it, you know, by by kind of fuel source, and I think it paints a, a pretty interesting picture. and And it gets to the point about there's no single ener there's no single fuel source, and that every one of these makes a contribution over time. And the projections, as you can see. Obviously, with natural gas and you know much of the work that's done here in the United States in terms of shale and shale gases and the production of natural gas and the availability of it, uh, you can see that increase of natural gas. And at the same time, if you look at the bottom there in the little gray, hopefully you can see that you know you can see that kind of coal, which is the more traditional um, fuel for for um, you know for power generation, kind of levels off. You also see a natural, a natural, but a very strong uptick in renewable energy, and this is important uh, because you know, in when we talk about hydrogen and hydrogen production, hydrogen uses, it is contributes to a very clean opportunity and fits into this kind of a bucket of renewable. Uh, next chart. Again, from a, a similar organization, if you're not familiar, I put these different sources as, you know, these are good places for you to uh, want, if you're interested in learning more, but it's called the EIA, it's the Energy Information uh, Administration. It is a part of the um, government, so it's in the Department of Energy. They do a lot of um, bipartisan analysis around energy. Uh, this chart here, again, the purpose of this chart is to, to, I'm trying to broaden our aperture a little bit of the discussion on energy and consumption. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see fuel sources. Again, it's by percent. So you can see in today's, in today's world, how were the percentages of, uh, of each of these fuel sources. And on the right, you see the percentages of those fuel sources being used for end, uh, end sector. Uh, usage. Again, so uh, very difficult. I wish I had a, a better way uh, to chart to chart this. Sometimes we, these charts are used in something called a sand key chart where you would actually see 
uh, you know, the size of each of those lines demonstrating the, the amount. But uh, for this purpose, I think what I hope to convey to you is that, you know, when I say all, all of the above, where, where we are today in an energy and transition, these percentages over time on the left-hand side of source will change depending on availability, depending on cost. You can see today renewables at 12%, but the chart I showed you before where you see by you know, 2050 that rise, there's gonna be where you're gonna start to see more and more renewables. And so again, in a, in a, um, a system that, that has a, traditionally, a traditional um, infrastructure, now adding renewables as a lot of different um, opportunities and dynamics as we think of uh, the infrastructure of the future. And the same thing on the right-hand side, you can see how uh, the, the different sectors are using different pieces of, of this energy. This is really important. Um, I mean, we could probably talk a lot about that. And Jay and I talked about potentially after this session that we would might host a workshop or two for all interested in, in uh, this kind of uh, you know, energy uh, decarbonization and hydrogen. Uh, so there'll be opportunities for us to dig a little bit deeper. So next slide. I always think of, and I said it before, I always think that within this space, when you think about, you know, when there's, when there's a challenge and when there's a transition, there's an opportunity. And, and there's several different, again, several different um, documents that have been published both in the Department of Energy where they've looked at what they've called their quadrennial technology review. They've looked at their, you know, more of an energy review. There's several different documents and, and, and they all lay out in somewhat roadmaps and roadmaps for how we move in the future. But those roadmaps need innovation. And that's where the University of Central Florida can play a strong role is, is how to do that. And I think what's also pretty critical if you read any of these things is that we're, you know, this pace of technology is changing so quickly and you know and this challenge is so large that traditional methods of research to you know the way the government would do research potentially the way the academics academia would do it is, and then business would do it has to change right We're, this approach and this little quote from bill gates kind of sums it up is that you know in order to to do this transformation that's needed across the country and the world then looking at different mechanisms by which governments, you know, uh, research institutions, academia, businesses, and private sectors work in a very different way. We have to have a different way, otherwise you can't, you can't get there. And I think that's just the message. But again, a lot of information out there. And if we get an opportunity to host that workshop, we can share much more of this. Uh, next slide. So one of the things, you know, you, you kind of see that little mosaic down there. And the purpose of that is there's a lot, when you, when you talk energy, it's such, it's, it's broad, right? It's by sector, it's by fuel type. Um, it's, it, so you really have to navigate and find where your research, um, you know, where, where you, the work that you're doing in your research and how that, how that ties into kind of this mosaic. But I think the important thing is, you know, people are ready and, and just, you know, they're latching on to how do we, how do we, you know, innovate in all of these different, you know, buckets that I have here. And some of them are really challenging us, right? What is that energy infrastructure going to look like of the 21st century? How does hydrogen potentially fit into that? And on the right, and I know Jay is going to talk a lot more about it, but I just grabbed a couple clips just from the Department of Energy. And you can just see the, the sizes of dollars that are being put into this, right? So when DOE announces a $52.5 million program to accelerate clean hydrogen, they're, this is, they're serious and they're not, you know, this is a multi-year focused effort. Uh, so there's a lot of, again, good information there's a strategy, at least in our in, in um, our country, has a strategy through the organizations within the Department of Energy and its supporting organizations. And hydrogen does play a big role, and it has opportunities, and those opportunities are right now. So next slide. 
another way to think about hydrogen's contribution. And I'll try to talk a little bit on that chart if you could see it uh, well enough from left to right. And I think part of it, when you think about hydrogen, right, it's first of all, you got to produce it, you got to transport it, and then you got to use it. That's the simplest way I can think about it. So right now on that left side, you know, hydrogen production, pr production comes from a lot of different fuel sources, that same mix of fuel sources I talked about earlier. And you'll notice that, you know, renewables, nuclear, and I say fossil, and you'll see words like CCUS, and that means there's a lot of research in, in deployments right now of, you know, using fossil fuels, but being able to capture the carbon and then use that carbon and use that carbon. But, but within the hydrogen context, those, those are sources for the development and, and use of, har, of, of, um, of hydrogen for the production and generation of it. And also you have gas, the natural gas. Right now, uh, natural gas uh, probably takes up um, a big portion of um, the hydrogen production is comes from that. You can see my second bullet there on that top bullet. Natural gas accounts for three quarters of the global hydrogen production today. And what you're seeing is that as costs of renewables come down, then renewables will offer an opportunity to be part of the hydrogen uh, generation. And I think one thing I've learned throughout my career, especially within the Department of Energy is um, everything is dependent on cost, right? Because that cost gets trickled down to the consumer, to the product, to the industry. And so um, cost drives, you know, drives pathways forward. So as renewables costs come down, they become more appealing. As natural gas prices have come down, they have become more appealing. Um, and then if you look on the, the, the right-hand side um, quickly on, on, the, on the chart, is if it, so if you think about where's the dominated industry for the use of hydrogen, those purple bubbles there um, are those, you know, so hydrogen is used in ammonium fertilizer productions, it's used in different kinds of steels and metal production, it's a lot of chemical and industrial kind of processes today. That's the bulk of where um, hydrogen production is used. Now, if you shift up to the, the blue ones on the top around transportation, it's been much investment around, you know, um, you know, hydrogen, a hydrogen fuel cell, cars, uh, semi trucks, uh, you know, different kinds of, of uh, large scale uh, off road trucks. And when you think about those, then you have to start thinking about, okay, now it's you got refueling stations. How do things get delivered? Is the infrastructure ready? for a transportation system like that. So there's, a lot, again, a lot of research and work in prototyping and um, delivery mechanisms to, to be considered. And also, if you look at the orange bubble down there, um, there's the, how is hydrogen potentially used in you know, multifamily buildings, commercial buildings, those kind of things. Uh, there's something called uh, you know, district energy and those mechanisms are also used for, you know, in kind of uh, city, city uh, environments. So hydrogen has a lot of applications. I guess that's the easiest way to sum it up. It can be produced from a lot of sources and it has a lot of opportunity. And the beauty about it, it offers a way to, for us to think about decarbonization. Uh, next slide. Oh, well, that was quick. Uh, so let me just say a couple things in, in, sum, in summary. Um, I think that, you know, when you think about energy, it just in general, and for sure hydrogen, because hydrogen has this opportunity to be, uh, uh, to be contributing to clean energy, as I think of energy is, you know, it's, it's about energy security, it's about resiliency, it's about economic prosperity, and there is you know, it impacts, there's economic impacts. It has the ability to create jobs. It, it has the ability to be a, you know, a, a place where technology innovation occurs. I think you'll hear a lot, you know, if, you're, if you listen to, you know, um, for instance, for instance um, the current Secretary of Energy, uh, Secretary Granholm, or, you know, um, other, uh, other administrators that, 
this this idea of clean energy you know it's a once in a lifetime it's our it's 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 the point in time where we 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 can step up and there's a lot of innovation and where innovation is is a lot of clean new kind of technologies new jobs and new creations so thank you for giving me the time uh, hopefully it was somewhat inspirational and inviting and we i will turn it over to jay for the second half of our talk you know i think i think i ne neglected to say <laughs> because I, I appreciate the introduction but the introduction you know one of the things that didn't come out is i'm now here at the university of central florida and and fortunate enough to you know be the director of the school of modeling simulation and training so i'm right in your, everyone's backyard here and uh, we we at the at the school look forward to uh, more engagements and more conversations. Um, thank you, Subit. And wow, it is not every day that I follow a former Secretary of Energy. So, well, with that said, and I cannot avoid saying that, um, let me focus on the right side of the um, this chart. In Orlando or at UCF, we are uh, fortunate to be having some of the best companies global with global brand names to be located who are working in this space. For example, Siemens, Mitsubishi, and a lot of others. So we, I see a huge potential uh, to what Dr. Bohenek mentioned, kind of follow up at UCF on that. With that said, also in, in Keter, in the center wide, this is the decarbonization we used to call low carbon technologies. It is a very big um, focus with for the reason that I'm going to say next. Well, just a few days ago, we had um, what is called the Hydrogen Shot Summit, like following up President Kennedy's moonshot in the 60s. So the, the, there is, has been introduced what is called energy art shots. And the very first one of those is on hydrogen, exactly for the reason that Grace was mentioning in the previous talk, that it can be actually addressing many of the, many of the urgent situations that we have got, um, uh, got to address. Now, what is decarbonization? Well, we can all give multiple types of definitions, but one way to think that is to take carbon uh, away from whatever is released to the atmosphere, or even better, to actually capture it out to kind of negate some of the cumulated or cumulative uh, uh, emissions that you have done so far. Also, one thing is that, well, I, I was asking myself how, how excited people are or common people are, because at the end, we are a public university and we have got a responsibility to the society and to our neighbors to mention to them that we are working on this very, uh, very important topic. So I did a, uh, I did not do a Google search, actually Google search shows a very similar number being from the academics, I did a Google scholar search and the numbers basically says that people are talking about it. And also another way of putting that is the bill that, well, it is not a bill yet, it is being talked about, about, and there are more than 2,500 pages in this document. So I focused only on hydrogen and carbon capture removal portion. Just there, we have about $20 billion uh, if it is passed to be allocated. So that is our opportunity to be kind of looking at. Just four regional hydrogen hubs would be $8 billion. If I'm an energy student or energy researcher, well, in spite of all the gloomy messages, there is no better time to be getting excited because this is the time for innovation and 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 a new new um, development. Well, another one way to sh kind of repeat the same thing that Dr. Bohanek mentioned: the decarbonization encompasses every aspects of life, not just power generation. Like power generation and heat production, only twenty five percent. Then uh, industry, twenty one percent. Like steel, we cannot live without steel or cement in the current modern civilization, right? And then transportation, buildings. In other words, there is meaning if CO2 goes to the atmosphere, nobody cares where that CO2 came from or where it came from we, because we cannot put walls in the sky. So we have to basically do all or it does not really make sense. So with that said, I'll have to actually put up one more uh, uh, picture there, kind of following up what uh, Professor Johnson was mentioning. So this is about one barrel of oil now because and that kind of leads to about 45 gallons of products now we do fractional distillation to get different products and we see pretty much every single thing that we do in life in modern civilization is connected to that and since these are all coming from different molecular weights of carbon 
if we have to remove one slice out, if you have to remove one barrel out, we have to remove pretty much every single slice out. We cannot keep on using jet fuel derived from pet crude oil and just completely make all the automobiles to be EV, right? Because we still have, we need the jet fuel and we need the crude oil. And, and, and so in other words, we have to remove pretty much, for example, these other products that include plastics. Meaning if any one of us ask ourselves what we have touched from the time that we got up to the morning, pretty much every single thing that we did has some form of plastics. We need a complete changeover in our society. We may say that decarbonization is nothing but saving the human civilization from human civilization, right? Because the way we have been used to be doing things has to be rethought. So with that said, there is another way of putting the same chart, but this time geographically. And on the left side, you see that well, it is just not United States or EU. It is the entire world is producing these greenhouse gases. Why? Because as we saw in the previous set of slides, the quality of life is directly related to these activities that produce CO2. So we have to, and we cannot just tell others that, well, you, we have done, we have got it made and by, sorry, we cannot do it, right? So and as a result, you can see on the right side, even the EU and America, those are the bottom two lines they are coming down and thanks to our innovation, thanks to DOE for all the great innovations that have come out of them, we have come down almost maybe 30% or 40% down. But look at the whole uh, um, world, meaning the amount of this increase completely overwhelms the come amount that we have decreased. So we have to have a, not only across all the sector, a holistic, but also a global, global target for our decarbonization effort. With that said, I'm going to go through three very quick samples, which are kind of relevant for uh, UCF uh, as we are doing. One of them is decarbonization of steel and cement, because these are very difficult industry sector to decarbonize. And on this, because for example, in cement manufacturing, we need coke, coke comes from coal and coke is used both for heat purpose, but also for chemical for as a reducing agent. Well, luckily for us, hydrogen can be a reducing agent too, because hydrogen can capture the oxygen or make the oxide to be metal and then we can process. So that is why hydrogen could be a good replacer and also hydrogen can produce heat as well. We have started a project with, with funding from Sandia Lab, not totally chemical side of the, uh, of, the, of the steel and cement industry, but how to convert waste heat from those two industries into electric power. Next, next one. Now, this is a very big one. So our whole, whole infrastructure of power generation is going through some tremendous changes. Obviously, solar and wind have come in a big way, but then we have to store them. We can store in a lithium ion storage, but for longer term, we need to do water electrolysis. And then first of all, we have to have the water storage and the amount of water that you need for a uh, say 250 megawatt gas turbine is tremendous. So water itself would be an issue. And, and, and then again, on the very bottom, I still have left natural gas. Maybe with time that would be eliminated to be completely green with the green hydrogen based, but this whole ecosystem has to be looked at. And this is going to be requiring tremendous amount of uh, innovation. For example, hydrogen raises the question that maybe the NOx will go up because it burns hotter. Well, that is actually with one of our industry colleague or partner in the city, we created a tracking tool. It is just taking the data from EPA uh, website and make it publicly available to see how we are doing. Over the last three decades or two, yeah, three decades, we have done tremendously well in spite of the fact that the temperature has gone up. So it is not automatically easy to say that that would be the case, meaning we should be able, we should not be worrying about NOx emission, but we like to pacify the public. So that is why that tool is there. Next thing is that uh, where we are going to get the waters. So we actually have started a new uh, idea, which is being, part of is being patented at UCF where we are going to have everything in a closed cycle so that the water is actually harvested back so that we do not need water back for the back for the electrolysis. And we have got a number of projects going up. Uh, actually, one of those just got uh, in the UCF today a few days ago, along with mine and Subit's project. And the last main slide is that potential hydrogen up. Orlando has got a huge visibility in the whole world. Um, we probably can piggyback on that visibility and, and actually start doing something pretty novel. We can create a hydrogen hub, whether it is local or regional, doesn't matter. We, we have got some of the best companies in the whole, whole world located right 
two of those right in Orlando. We can team up with them for doing hydrogen blending for power generation, commercial avi aviation. I'm talking about the large one, not that uh, the, the business jets and personal airplanes. That is a very difficult to decarbonize sector. Hydrogen can even again be very crucial for that purpose. Um, and we have got a very large airport that is very visible to the whole world. Steel and cement, I already mentioned, and we are talking to the, some of those companies in Alabama mobile area. Um, then we actually just teamed up with a small local startup called Looped Air. They are actually trying to do hydrogen powered uh, fuel cell driving uh, urban uh, air and road mobility. Well, that hydrogen could be coming out of the hydrogen hub as well and Lynx and Disney. So in other words, we can create a pretty good to, uh, ecosystem right at Orlando that would be very visible to the whole world and they can learn from us. With that said, I'll be, that is my last slide. And obviously in use in, in academics, professors do not do absolutely anything except talk and it is the students and the group that do the work. So I cannot bad, but give the credit, the credit to them. With that, that is the end of my talk.